Hi, Peter here. Thank you for joining us for our 17th virtual reading. I can't believe it's been that long, but we have been doing this uh, every Friday night since March, since the lockdown. We can't wait to uh, see you in person and uh, have these readings in person, but until then, Zoom will have to do, and you know, it's actually pretty good. One of the things is that um, when you're looking at the screen and you're looking close up at the reader, it's actually quite intimate, which I never expected. Anyway, I'd like to thank my Murphy writing colleagues, Stephanie Cawley and Taylor Coyle, who make all of this happen and make me look good. Tonight, our special guest is Patrick Rizal, and I'll introduce him in a moment. If you missed any of our previous virtual readings or would like to re-experience them, go to the Murphy Writing YouTube page. Stephanie will put that link in the chat box, or just go to YouTube and write in Murphy Writing, and you'll see all sorts of uh, people that have been there. And uh, check it out. And uh, also, if you're new to us, Every day, Monday to Friday, we have a series of writing prompts on our Canvas website. You'll find a witty quote and a prompt that'll get you starting to write either a poem, prose, fiction, or nonfiction. And also, you can post what you write if you like, and who knows, maybe somebody will comment on it if you'd like. And two days a week, Monday at 4 p.m. and Wednesdays at 7 p.m., we have a write-in where we take the prompt of the day, and we get together on Zoom, and we write together, and at the end, we share a little bit of what we wrote. You're welcome to join us for these activities, and these are free. Now, some things that are not free, because we do have to pay for bread and butter. Uh, no, we have to pay for, well, we have to pay for stuff. I don't even know what we're paying for anymore. Anyway, on Saturday, August 1st, we are offering a one-day short story workshop, um, and that's being led by Jade Jones. It's going to be terrific, and there's a few spots left. And there's also one spot left in a poetry workshop that Stephanie will be leading called Extending the Document, and that's a five-week workshop, July 26th to August 28th. If you want that, you better register it right away. And uh, that's by go to murphywriting.com. And while you're at murphywriting.com, you'll also see that we have special writing critiques. If you have some writing you've already done, would like feedback on it, you can uh, look and see what we have, and one of our faculty members will be happy to help you with it. All right, murphywriting.com, that'll get you started. All right, so if you're new to Zoom, here's what's going to happen. Um, when Patrick is reading, you'll notice that there's a reaction button at the bottom of your Zoom page. You can click that, and you can either clap or you can put a thumbs up and that way encourage him. Or you can just go like that or clap in the old way. That'll be terrific. So who is Patrick Rizal? Patrick Rizal is a multidisciplinary artist and the author of four books, the most recent, Brooklyn and Alluvian. He's a recipient of the Lenore Marshall Poetry Prize from the Academy of American Poets, fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation, the National Endowment for the Arts, the um, Fulbright, has got a Fulbright <laughs> Scholar Program, and he has recently taught at Princeton University, Sarah Lawrence College, the University of Texas at Austin. And uh, in addition to working with youth uh, people of color for a long time and incarcerated people, he's also a professor of English at Rutgers University at their Camden campus. Find out more at more, well, no, find out more at patrickrizal.com. Please welcome Patrick Rizal. Can't wait to hear you, Pat. Am I good? Can you hear me? You're good. Terrific. Terrific. Um, I just want to check the time, make sure that I don't go over. Um, it's, uh, it's great to see a lot of folks. This is, this is pretty, pretty amazing. You know, I, um, I want to say first that I got asked to do a bunch of readings. Um, I did Patricia Smith's birthday. I did a quick couple of minutes and John Murillo had a, a book launch that we had planned a long time ago. And um, I, I had been asked to do a lot of readings this summer and I'm, I really wanted to buckle down and, and get my own work done. But when Peter asked if, um, if I would do a reading, I couldn't turn him down. <laughs> um, I just moved back to, to New Jersey. I've known Peter for a long time before I even had my first book and um, Peter's been just this pillar here in New Jersey, in the New Jersey area uh, with the getaway. Um, I know him through, through Dodge and I'm, I'm just so grateful, not just to him personally, but to what he's done for the writing community around here. And increasingly, um, I've been very lucky. My, I've, you know, a lot of people have, been able to read my work. I have an international audience at this point, and I feel really blessed in that. And it creates a kind of paradox for me because I will always be a New Jersey poet. And um, 
I'm I'm still deeply deeply committed to to the local, um, and I, I want to say that because it, it when I was coming up, being a local poet meant something disparaging, and it, to me, it's not disparaging at all. I think that we have a great responsibility to record and honor the things that are right in front of us as William Carlos Williams was uh, an incredible model for. So um, I'm really, really honored and happy to, to be doing this reading. Um, it's, you know, it's not, it's not official yet, but um, I, um, I believe that I'm gonna be having a new book coming out um, within within a year, year and a half or so, and it's probably gonna be a selected poems. So um, I, what I wanted to do was read some new work tonight, and if I have, if I have time, I'd love to be able to, um, you know, read some stuff from, from each of the books if I can make it all the way through. So um, right now, this is, the, uh, this is the title poem. It's called The Last Thing or Song for When They Take It All Away. And it was prompted by uh, a storage space that I had that's probably just a mile and a half from here. And I couldn't pay the monthly bill and I lost everything that was, that was in that storage space. <clears throat> the last thing, song for when they take it all away. They take the books, the crates of 80s 12 inch singles, a few dozen letters from Manila, LA, Seville. They take my stinky trash can and cracked plastic chair, the rickety plywood shelves, 11 photos of my mother, leaving me with one. They take the dim shots of my brother's young faces beside mine. They take away the clean sheets folded among the soiled ones, the hand towels stained with fevers and shit and official notices of all my debt stuffed in a box with three dead flies. Oh, and the tangled brush of a woman whom I love for one whole week, which remembering her makes me lift my hand as if to propose half a prayer or to illustrate the best way to answer a deaf king is to drop a fist on a heavy table in place of blasphemy's last syllable. They take it all from a cold, rented, five-foot space. And when I can't pay, they cross out my name, double shackle the gate, fill every proper form, and price the pitiful lot for the block. They call me to cough up over and over say explain yourself shame is like you're made of ten thousand beautiful doors and every day you try to keep them all from flying open at once they reach inside and take the boxes of shoes and old shirts, the third hand scratched up oak desk I heaved up 20 steps overlooking West Grand Ave with a battalion of metallic hands. They'll take away silence. They'll take away touch. They'll take music too, which is when I'll stand up alone and walk toward you and offer a few fingers for you to lead me to an empty floor and away. They'll take the light. They'll confiscate my teeth and leave the knives with no handles. They take it all away. They take away weeping and take away laughter. Not last to go are the goats as if I could forget the curses. And ha ha, they'll take my eyes and they won't even eat them. They have taken so much. I am standing now somewhere at the end of a road which leads to a beach beside a sea that a million ghosts keep crossing, leaving everything I once had, everything I've become, everything electric in a muscle to make one minuscule move again toward the beautiful in that wacky wandering in that bloody path in that smoky inventory of a quarter century in that ambling in that sprint toward every gorgeous living thing no matter how tortured or peaceful i am going i am almost completely gone i am stepping away watch me as i leave the forks i leave the hammers i leave the bones i am left with love I leave the boiled coins, the thin shells of swans. I am left 
with love. I leave the latches and bolts open. I am left again and again with love. I leave and I leave and I am left again and again and I can't seem to shake it. The rage leaves me and leaves me again and again and love is left. It is all that is ever left. And today I am blessed. I am the last thing burning. Um, so I believe that that is going to be the title poem to, to the new book. Um, I want to read a, a poem called The Changing Hymn, Allegory for the Singing Lover. Um, this song's for my beloved. It's for Mary Rose, who's this beautiful singer. <clears throat> the Changing Hymn, Allegory for the Singing Lover. During the trouble years, my love sang the same song every day. But every day, she changed slightly the words. One day, she sang a song for sweepers. And the next day, the sweepers became hangmen. On Friday, the hangmen turned into willows. In September, the willows turned back to broomsticks broken in the hands of janitors. She and I used to play a game waiting for the ferry or on long walks to my auntie's house. One of us would begin a song and the other would repeat the line, changing just one word, back and forth like that drawing and redrawing the images of the lyrics each time growing an extra eye or tongue or losing a foot one word at a time the game gave us nuns whom we loved on skateboards and who ate steamed buns in muncie where they confessed to the best western desk they were once boys who were once orchids who were snakes first slithering through midtown palaces blazing on trains turned rocket ships in oxnard and track in Parlin before straddling massive salamanders in Paris where the sisters farted on the heads of billionaires and shook tambourines in their yellow teeth before they got down on their knees and prayed and the cold mist of the ferry was always good and the cold air between our house and my auntie's just as good. My darling loved most to sing in dark places especially dank bars, packed with locals who were swift to rise from their crummy chairs and stagger to their feet, setting their drinks on the closest table, or they'd simply fling their glasses to the floor to finally hold one another so close they could sniff each other's cheeks, though hardly anyone knew another's name. My love put their tables in her song, and the back room's musty wood, and the dusty lavender smell of fat Factories beside the perfume of goat breath, like a gift inside the song, and sometimes the crowd would swell into laughter all together to see if such a singer and such a song could hold the joyful sound of a hundred strangers, and they would stomp and twirl to see if their dance could keep up with my love song. And with all their singing and swinging, stepping and sliding, they forgot their walking legs and their meat hooks and the thick pine smell that haunted their saws. My lover's song so fearless, sometimes the dead got up too. For even the most crotchety of our elders knew if we opened ourselves up wide enough to the song, the song would not leave us even lying down. And this is how her singing became a country that could go everywhere. A vagabond that moved through whoever welcomed it. This is how a song became a little nation inside a hundred people grooving so hard no one could say exactly what a nation was. The land, the people upon it, or the ones buried in its fields and hills. For the dancers were pure tremor, cycle and vibration. Migrants, they were pure wave, sometimes short on rent. My love would sing 
for quick money in big, beautiful halls, crystalline and sad, where the people were also sad, for their ties were always straight, and their clothes were well, were well pressed, and they dared not scuff the good gleam of their belt buckles, that kind of sad. They were so rich with the wealth of silks and platinum garland and fast boats, the marble floors of their salons so clean, you couldn't tell a single blade was put to wood or that a drop of blood had fallen on their shiny tiles. No evidence of the making. But by God, when my love sang, every one of these bright buttoned folks would sway barely budging at first, so you couldn't notice the ghosts stirring inside them, like a sugar starting to cook into its first kick of liquor, swirling now, nudging them like a sweet inner fog. They tried, oh, did they try not to let the rhythm in. They gripped the table silver in their fingers and curled their toes inside their shoes. And just as the music got into their stiff hips, their bodies relented. It was then my love would begin to fit new words to this familiar tune and clever. She would hide me inside the song, maybe just the crook of my neck or the pink scar across my forehead, which she'd touch to calm me when I was sick. Sometimes she'd smuggle into the song my busted up pinky, my bruised feet, or my father's piano, and I would laugh even louder when the coiffed ones laughed so hard and loose they seemed to be breaking all their great-grandfather's rules, for even the powerful understood the power of what hidden, how a woman's voice of wild harps and charging horses was guiding this monster of a song inside them, while all us savages and outcasts rode stowaway, tucked into the tune with all our fists and all our feet and all our sweat and grime soiling their powdered armpits and fancy panties in public. And when my love finished, they would suddenly close up like a patient quickly suturing himself shut. At the end of the night, their long candles burned to their bit wicks. A few of them would approach my love and shake her hand as if she had only one arm. They'd thank her as if she had no eyes to kiss. And she would tell me going home, she knew the song would not stay inside them the way it seemed to abide in us, that spirit which makes the hammer and hoe blade ring and the hospital's faucet water so cool to the lips you might lick the spigot and the engine of the trolley rattle hot. This very old spark of the body working and working and working it all on out. And there were mornings, though awake, my love, would lie in bed like empty luggage. For many nights she moaned in her sleep as if the song were leaving her for good too. But then in a week or two or a month, often after the winter cold lost its sting to the first ginkgo buds, we'd lift our heads at the same time and hear a small breaking, the cracking of a crate smashed glass and crystal, which gave away to flutes and cuckoos, the heavy steps of old ghosts to keep the new ghosts company, this widening country of wi wandering bodies, all the sound through which she roamed and every sound which roamed within us, she made and unmade and remade again in the trouble time, everything. She sang and unsang out of fevers and blood where no one was ever lonely. She never wanted others to be lonely. She sang so no one would ever be lonely. I'm speaking in the past as if we will never exist again. And yet every song changes as it goes. We've already begun to turn into tomorrow. We are the soonest sounds to come. I'm gonna assume that you all are clapping because that one's from Mary Rose. So thank you. Thank you if you're even not clapping. <clears throat> um, 
I would love to read a poem from my first book, Up Rock Head Spin, Scramble and Dive. <clears throat> this is a, this is a, I want to read this for my brother, Nicholas Anthony. And, um, you know, this glare coming in through the window, it makes me think that I have spittle coming out of my mouth through the whole reading. <laughs> So if you see me doing this, it's because like, I don't want to be drooling in front of you guys. But I want to read this, uh, I want to read this poem. It's for, um, yeah, my sister-in-law, Heidi, and my brother, Nick, and they know why I'm reading. I love you guys. <clears throat> Who says the eye loves symmetry? Doesn't the eye love the ragged tear of sky, the treetop shred horizon? The eye, after all, loves the dizzy dip of a road, its precarious tilt towards a ravine, only wrist deep water and giant smooth rocks to break the sky's fall. The eye loves the bit peach window agape, buildings caught mid swagger across a skyline. The eye loves unpainted pickets, cracked planks, the harlequin, the prow poked out of water like a chin, loves the evergreen arched over a flood like an old man looking into the street for a hand, loves a sawed link, chewed rope, a birch's slants, but the eye can't love what it can't see. The woman striding tired and brave amid the lobby's bustle and under her shirt, a single breast. Um, that was originally for um, a friend named Maureen Klein, um, whom I used to drive to her radiology appointments. <clears throat> um, she was very, very dear to me. Next, this one's for Jersey from a My American Kundiman. <clears throat> Kundiman ending on a theme from Tila Rock. Let me just see how much time I've got left. Okay. <clears throat> Kundiman ending on a theme from Tila Rock. Your morning's everyday stained call of exhaust. Your plum bludgeon dusk, your fine stench and luckless French kiss. Your can I get down bliss, your God gone, blessed Jones for long. Your Jersey Baroque, your mercy nine sirens prying every sky. Your name, your flow, your funk, your everyday nasty, your very revelry, your breakneck scat, the loot, your boost, your rags, your 7,000 island slang, your hype, your hips, your spit, your sickest wit, and snip your every severed syllable, your blunt toke fables, your smokes reprieve, your levers torque bearing your body every day, every lovely mucking hum, your mic sound nice, every check one, your fade, your cut, your knife, your jazz on two, your bass, your every cleft, your left breast, your folly, your lung, your modest rot, your alibata tongue, do you want it? Hell yeah, baby, because it's yours. <laughs> I love that poem, man. So fun to read. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to skip ahead. If I got time to read from <clears throat> Bone Shepherds, I will, but I think, uh, hopefully he's still there. I got, cause I, I need to shout somebody out whose name I saw. I, I switched to gallery view really quick. And I believe that my homeboy, Harry Jenkins is logged in and, um, Harry and I, we were in the same crew growing up, and Harry, aka Cubby, aka DJ Daz, is one of the illest DJs that you just have, maybe you've heard of him, but you probably have not, but he was, we would do, we would DJ parties, or we would go into battles, and other DJs would be like, oh, CHP, they got a, uh, they got a ringer, because that guy, battled in dmc battles I, harry never competed in dmc battles but he would have he he was on that level and um he's here tonight man harry man i just want to send love to you bro i miss you and i hope your family's doing good <clears throat> and um this is a this is a poem about djing we used to um 
we used to take the cheap turntables and cut them up and turn them into like battle ready turntables. There's a historical importance to this. The phonograph is invented by Thomas Edison. I grew up in Edison, New Jersey. And Thomas Edison was an imperialist, which means that he believed in the, the, the military domination and essential murder of Filipinos in order for the United States to gain the Philippines as, as, a, as a territory. And the phonograph, if you listen, Christine, I, I don't know if Christine Balance is here. Hi, Christine, if you are. But <clears throat> in Christine's um, beautiful book, Tropical Rendition, she talks about how the, the phonograph is used as a kind of tool for imperialism. And here we are in the 1980s and 1990s, taking this machine that was meant to dominate Filipinos, cutting it up, putting it back together, and dancing. And to me, that's an incredible metaphor for innovation and art and improvisation. So this poem, this is for Harry, it's for Daz, a scavenger's ode to the turntable or a note to Thomas Alva Edison. I usually sing a song when I do this. Two turntables and a mic. I want fat MC on the set. A two turntables and a mic. I want fat MC on the set. Mm. Two turntable, one fat MC, a two turntables and a mic, a one fat MC on the set. We lifted the precious arm first, then the platter. We pulled free the belt and unscrewed the top. I didn't take shop or build a whole lot by hand, but I was pretty good with a knife. I poked the half dull blade clean and gentle through the turntable's plastic. I sawed down four inches straight as I could make it. Me and my boys, sons of cops, bookkeepers and ex-priests, picked up gear other DJs didn't want no more. One prep school kid who just bought a shiny new mixer tossed out his two-month-old Newmark, which we picked from the garbage and hoisted home. We harvested the slider from the rich kid's rig. I stripped the wires, tips, and soldered them to pitch contacts in a basement of a maple split in Edison, New Jersey, we were learning to turn anything into anything else. While our mothers played mahjong in the sala and our fathers bet slow horses and the government bombed Iraq. We learned to poise pennies on the cartridge head so the diamond stylus would sit deep in the vinyl's groove. A dance floor could turn from whining to riot quick if a record skipped when we spun back the wax to its cue. We stayed awake from noon to noon, digging out from crates some forgotten voice or violin to scratch. We juggled and chirped. We perfected the grind of a downbeat and dropped it on the bass line coming round. Half trash, half hallelujah. Our hands cut Bach to Bambada and made a dance hall jump. We held one ear to the syncopated kick and the other to a future music that no one else could hear. Out of a hunk of rescue junk, we built a machine to mix the classics. We faded and transformed. We chopped up masters and made the whole block bounce. Two turntables and a mic. I want fat MC on the set. I two turntables and a mic. I want fat MC on the set. I two turntables, one fat MC. Two turntables and a mic. I want fat MC on the set. Love you, guys. <laughs> um, I think I'm almost. I'm almost out of time. I'm gonna read um, one more. One more poem. I'll, I'll close with a, a poem from Bone Shepherds because it's the only collection I did not, I did not read from. <clears throat> and while I was um, teaching at, um, I hope I can find this poem quickly. While I was teaching at um, um, the University of Texas, I had this ter terrific group of um, <clears throat> grad students, and um, you know, part of the Part of the thing that I, I was, and I'm always trying to communicate to my students is poetry is an expressive art and we can think our way into it. We can intellectualize, we can theorize, but ultimately poems are about the discovery, the communication, the transformation of feeling and being transformed by that transformation of feeling through language. 
And um, it also happened that one of my colleagues in the English department was doing a Walt Whitman project. And he had asked me if I would read the whole thing of Song of Myself. So went into the studio and over the course of about three hours, I recorded Song of Myself and I read it the way that I read my own poems. And I was, I was gassed afterwards. I fell asleep. In the middle of the night, I woke up and I wrote this poem for my students. Thank you guys, by the way, for coming. Peter, Stephanie, Taylor, um, just really appreciate the opportunity to, to, you know, run back through some of my, some of my older work and read some newer work and, and, and just share a little bit of time um, with all of you. So thank you. <clears throat> Despedida ardiente. Dear feverless, dear poets, dear lovesick ones now cured, there might be bloodless battles to be won, but right now, stout your maw with your finest curses. Yap your demons to their proper graves. O oh, meek weepers, asymmetries be kissed. Let the trash stack in the kitchen. Keep your lover a full day from work. Oh, sweet neglect. Oh, nectarine. Those bitter pits are meant for more than nibbling. There is a holy jump off. There is a funky genesis. There is a reason love and jive kind of rhyme. You oblong fruit, not three days ripe. Somewhere in you lies the science of typhoons, a dream of strings. Oh, dirty word. Oh, first murder. Oh, cocoa butter whiff on a smoky bus. There are theories we're made of mostly nothing but motion. Oh, gap-toothed guitar. Oh, sound hole, you faraway drum, you slang mouth blessing, you long chime, you chamberless sextet. Let me leave you with a few last words. When mad dogs break chains to run at you, charge back. Bear your very teeth no monster, I promise, outruns you. Whack them on the ankle with a stick. Chase the bastards down. Listen, this vertigo, this wreckage, this bad ballad straining the thickest tendons of your legs. Oh, darling sleepers, may you wake in the middle of the night to strange sounds, you champions of laughter. All you have to do is speak simply. Your business is the truth. Your heart's catastrophe is just a little of history's twisted bulwark. If there weren't a sky within your chest worth breaking, believe me, you would have stopped all this singing by now. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very, very much. Have a great night. Thank you, Patrick. What a joyful reading. That was, I needed that. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you all for, uh, thank you all for listening and for coming tonight. Um, next Friday night, we're having our second open mic. Um, look for the details on the uh, Murphy Writing Facebook page, as well as the Murphy Writing uh, website on Monday. We'll have those details up or Tuesday. We'll get them up, promise. And uh, if you uh, feel like writing with us, we have write-ins on Monday at 4 and next Wednesday at 7 p.m. Feel free to join us. It's free and who knows, make it a poem or a few lines of prose out of it. Um, thank you for coming. And uh, on the way out, you might see in the chat box, we put a pass the hat link. If you have some extra money, would like to support these free programs, help keep them going, we would accept that. But you don't have to do it. We're just so happy that you were here with us. Thank you so much. Again, Patrick, I feel blessed to to have you with us tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.